So the purpose of today's session is to share some of the things I've learned about diversity, equity and inclusion, and then collectively really for us to focus on understanding more about unconscious bias and some of the opportunities that we might all have to gain further understanding of our own biases and the things we can do really to mitigate um, bias. And obviously bias um, can lead to a culture um, which isn't inclusive. And so it's a really important um, topic and area to look at for all of us. I'm just going to start with a very brief story. So really around diversity, it, it is an opportunity for all. Um, and I don't know if anyone's seen the movie Code, Debugging the Gender Gap. I don't know if anyone wants to come off mute. Has anyone seen that film? No. Okay, no one has. Um, I really recommend it. It's a, it's a great um, movie about the real challenges in the technology industry and in getting uh, females into coding. Um, and I just wanted to share a brief story without ruining the movie for everyone. Um, but there was a story in there around the airbag and when um, the, a team of engineers invented the airbag for a car, it was this amazing success story around saving a lot of lives and it really revolutionized car safety. And after a few years of this being launched and new cars, um, it was just um, a lot of data coming in. And, and so the engineers and the sort of quality assurance were reviewing that. And, and what they realized sadly was that um, the airbags were designed really well to save male lives, um, but sadly um, not females. And that was really um, to do with the fact that um, the airbag design was for a specific type of um, human body or build. So they went back, they looked at, you know, why that was to obviously improve. And they realized that the entire team of engineers was male, were male. And um, that there was a real lack of diversity of thought around actually who they were designing the airbag for. Um, and so after that time, you know, obviously it was very sad in that it led to unnecessary loss of life, but that led to then that shared understanding of requiring or uh, really thinking about diversity around um, the innovation that can bring and then obviously uh, reflecting the customer base and ensuring that things are built for the customer and, and are fit for purpose. So in the long run, obviously um, an amazing achievement, but a kind of sad component of that, and that's that's covered in that movie, which was quite an interesting and eye-opening um, story for me at the time. And so, yeah, in terms of the, the I guess, the, the topic of diversity, really, it's, um, it's an opportunity for everyone. And I think, you know, often it's a natural human response to think sort of what's actually in it for me. And often um, the conversation around equality is kind of kept to the moral high ground. But I think a more powerful and sustainable way to frame this is really how it affects both businesses and individuals, um, because it's kind of what's in it for both of us. And there's so much in it. And there's lots of good research now around this. So um, McKinsey have done some really good research, which just shows um, the performance of organizations who um, are diverse and inclusive. Um, and you can see there, um, there's two graphs, for example, that focus on gender and ethnic diversity and that performance gap. Um, and, and so there's a, a lot of research now um, that's just really um, part and part with, I think, how we accept, you know, a high performing organization needs to look like and its practices around diversity, equity and inclusion. And so who's actually responsible for DE&I? And I took this screen grab, um, thank you to the team in Auckland, but you know, we all are. Um, as with culture, you know, um, everyone has a part to play in, in DE&I. And I think when we look at unconscious bias in particular, um, hopefully you'll I'll get a good understanding of the contribution that everyone can make in an organization. So I, I don't know if anyone's seen the iceberg model, but um, unconscious bias, and I guess particularly around the things that we may be familiar with with bias, there's this sort of iceberg model, um, and there's that waterline of visibility. So often when we ask people or when you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, the common um, kind of identifiers come out as kind of gender, age, race, 
perhaps ethnicity, but as you can see, um, there's actually a lot of biases that humans carry, um, and there's a lot of different uh, ways in which inclusion can occur. And so that could be things like beliefs, it could be work style, it could even be location, it could be um, education, you know, that's quite a common one. Um, so a lot of the time we're thinking sort of the 20% above the line, but really there's a lot um, involved around our biases. Is there anything missing from this kind of iceberg model that anyone feels is important to share on this call as part of that topic of diversity? Okay. I'll keep going. And so when you look at unconscious bias, there's again a fair amount of different types of bias that can occur. Um, and so I've sort of talked about, I guess, some of the biases we carry around, say, typecasting, um, but often actually there's other biases that will occur in the workplace. So these are some examples, there are many, um, but recency bias is a really good one to, to be aware of. So um, that's sort of when we give more importance to a, a recent event um, that maybe we're comparing to something that happened a long time ago. And so, you know, a good example of that might be like performance reviews, you know, where last week you had a conversation with someone and that's really fun to front of mind versus someone who's equally performed, but the conversation happened sort of two, three months ago. Um, proximity bias, you know, when you look at someone more favorably because you work with them really closely, either physically or in a kind of similar piece of work. And that may mean you hold a bias towards people you don't work with as closely. Um, the halo effect is often when you have a positive impression of a person uh, in one area and that sort of influences your feelings about them in another. Um, and affinity bias is another example where you look at more favorably about someone who um, you believe you have more in common with. Um, and you can see in the business context that these are often um, risk areas for us as an organization around bias occurring in our business practices. So, for example, interviews, um, you know, affinity bias. If you go in there and you find some common ground with someone, you may have a natural tendency to, uh, to feel they're a good fit over someone who you don't have any common interests with. Um, and obviously, there's lots of good practices we can put in place um, to help us ensure that those biases are, are, are kept in check. Does anyone else have any good examples of a kind of workplace, I guess, types of biases and, and maybe how they've seen those in the workplace that they want to share? Got a quiet audience today. It's okay. Um, we do have a practical activity at the end where you will be sharing, so we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Um, so look, next I wanted to play a very um, short video, which I think, um, you know, I've found like a, a really valuable insight. It's from Google and hopefully you haven't seen it and I've had to stop sharing so I can share a tab. Um, but I will hopefully be able to play this and hopefully it'll work. Um, and it's about three minutes long. I'm going to play it for about 10 seconds and then I'm going to just pause it to make sure that the sound is working. Everybody were aware of the stereotypes that they have. We're good? Yep, we're yeah. good. Yes, we're good. They have and the biases that they have. When we talk about unconscious bias, we're basically saying our worldview can actually exert an influence beyond our conscious awareness and it creates ambiguity. You go to an engineer who's built something extremely innovative. And you say, who do you think your user is? This is where I have the most fun. My name is TV Raman, and I led our work on Android accessibility for three years. Write down everything that you think you know about your user with respect to abilities, inabilities, special abilities, disabilities. Almost every assumption that you write down on that whiteboard about this is the user I think I'm building for is questionable because our various unconscious biases define the boundaries you're unwilling to expand. 
these biases, they're the shortcuts that our brain has created so that we can deal with the information that we process every single day. Right when we see anyone, whether we think about it or not, we are implicitly, automatically making judgments about how warm and competent that person or thing is. All humans need to make decisions, and so we fill in the blanks because our brains are wired to do that, and we fill in with things we don't know, with you know past experience. Oh, you pattern map to someone I think I should hire, so I'm gonna hire you versus this person because they didn't map because I can't fill in the blank because they don't look like me or they're not from my same background, and so I can't see how they're gonna make the jump. Every single person is great at things that you may not expect them to be, but it's really hard for us to see that when we're so powerfully guided by the things we expect to be true in the world. I grew up surrounded with this conversation about what you can't do and what you won't be able to do. My name's Enrico and uh, I'm an autistic software engineer. The first time I go through the performance review process, I was asked for five strengths. It was the first time that I had ever been prompted to think in that way about myself and it was really a life-changing moment for me. When we are working in our day-to-day -day jobs, we are still making judgments about the people around us, about the resumes we see, about the employees that we're trying to decide, you know, whether to put them on teams or not. People are very wedded to the idea that they can perceive something objectively and statistically they're wrong, but it's hard. You become attached to this idea that you can assess something by looking at it. These subtle, Assumptions we make about people can have lasting effects on who we're promoting, who we're hiring, who we're putting in leadership positions. We have the responsibility to understand the assumptions that we make and understand the errors that we make. But it's not just for the collective good. If you take the time to understand more about this, there are things that you can implement for yourself that'll help you develop as a leader and to do your job even better. It made me realize how often I have a very strong belief that is simply incorrect. When I look at one of these evaluation situations, the first question is how can I eliminate the sources of potential bias and leave just the data so we can actually make better decisions? If you're not conscious of the biases that you have, you're just not contributing at the level that you could and you're not innovating at the level you could. And so your products won't be as good. Your results won't be as good. When you think outside the box with respect to the assumptions you made about how somebody would use this wonderful thing you built, and then you sort of broaden that perspective as to who you change the world for, you build something even bigger. What would the world look like if... Alrighty, so... As you heard in the video, it's, um, you know, the human nature we, we, we're dealing with so much information every day that in order to successfully navigate our world, we're on autopilot most of the time. Um, and our brains are wired to therefore make connections. So often everything that's happened in your life to date, you know, will help you form those connections. Um, but because they're in the unconscious, we, um, we often carry bias into that decision making without realizing it. So. I think the big, the big uh, learning from that, you know, that video is that a key part of, of becoming more conscious around bias is, you know, learning what your biases are, recognizing them and then determining how you can um, reduce the chance of your biases playing out. So I'm just going to share my screen again just to talk through the activity. Just give me a moment. So. This is where you all come in. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do an activity. It's called I am but I'm not. So what I want everyone to do is to, I don't know if you can see that well enough, but get a piece of paper if you have one, fold it in half. And what I want to do is write on one side I am, and then on the other side I am not and in the middle put a fold with but, on, on the fold put but. And what we want to do is, you could have multiple if you want, we want to have a common identifier here. Um, so it could be like gender, ethnicity, um, sex, you know, female, male, um, or it could be um, education, it could be anything you want. 
And then on the other side, I want you to put a stereotype for that specific identifier that you uh, don't align with for yourself. Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to do this in silence for just two minutes. Then I'm going to um, organize you into breakout rooms, uh, small ones. So you can just talk through um, those stereotypes or those biases that you've experienced. And just to bring it to life as an example, so I've got my one, which is, you know, I am German, but I am not direct. Um, hopefully I'm self aware <laughs> enough. To know I'm not actually direct, but um, you know, often people perceive uh, me, or if I tell them I'm German, they uh, may think that I'm going to be direct because that's often a stereotype I've encountered of of being German. Um, so I'm just going to, before I get you to do that in silence um, and work on that, I'm just going to check if there's any questions. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording um, because I'm going to put you in breakout rooms, but essentially I'm going to give you uh, two minutes and then I'm going to allocate you automatically into some breakout rooms. When you're in the breakout room, please just um, self-organize and just share, just go around and share and I'll, be, I'll set up that up for about seven or eight minutes and then there'll be a timer that will bring me back. 